Hello, we are streaming live on Facebook and this is Dr. Cindy Hodgson here with Essential Therapies. I'm a physical therapist, exercise physiologist, and I am super excited to introduce Dr. Carol Davis, who is just one of my heroes and, and mentors. And I'm just giddy to, to be here with, with her. And let me change my screen here. I hope this looks like we got both of us on here. So that's good. Um, Carol is has just been all over the place in her career. I think she has been mostly in Miami, though. She is a professor emerita at Physical Therapy University of Miami in the Department of Physical Therapy, yes. And she has so much behind her name that I, I would take up a lot of time just going through your biography. I was looking at all of those things. But the, how I first learned about Carol Davis is through this book here. And I was in physical therapy school 26 years ago. I think it was in 94 in the fall. This this, this month where we really got into this book. And um, it was one of those books where I was, I was so into it that I literally looked up who wrote this and, and read <laughs> about the author, Carol Davis. And so that name stuck in my mind um, for a long time. And I'll go into that in a little bit. But then later on, um, she came out with this book. And boy, I wish we would have had this, this book here in, in my physical therapy program. But um, Carol, I just want to give you the opportunity to say a little bit about this book because you mentioned how much you you enjoy this book and that there's not a lot of people that that know about this book and I was I feel very fortunate that this was part of my physical therapy education and in our in our program we called it the touchy feely class. Yes. <laughs> so, um, but I, I want to hear a little bit about this and then also want to go in pretty quickly to just how you and I got to meet was through John Barnes. And of course I operate a John Barnes myofascial release approach a specialty clinic here in Toledo, Ohio. And so that is, is just very near and dear to my heart. And I wanna give you the opportunity to talk about the importance of this work with physical therapy and, and just how that has been integrated in, in your life. But I'll let you start with, with this book. With that book? Yeah. Well, thank you, Cindy. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and to celebrate PT month, physical therapy month with you. Um, I still remember the moment that I, that you introduced yourself to me. Um, and uh, you said how much you love that book. That book actually was, um, uh, I was, I was told by um, my mentor that I had to write this book. It was in Chicago in 1985. And we were at a conference, at a physical therapy conference, and I was sitting having lunch with Geneva Johnson. Many of the physical therapists here will know that name. Geneva Johnson is really the power behind, in my mind, the power behind the DPT as the, um, as the entry-level degree in physical therapy. But Geneva Johnson was my program director in 1967 to 69 uh, at Case Western Reserve. And she and I uh, maintained touch over the years. And we did some projects together. We did some accreditation, uh, commission on accreditation things together. And then she sat down with me in 1985. And um, I was in Boston at the time, um, uh, um, co-chairing the program in Boston uh, at, at Sargent College at Boston University. And she said, Carol, there's no book about um, communication skills and values and ethics. And, um, and I want you to write that book. And I, I was a little reluctant, but I did have course materials because I had been teaching in clinical education. I was the academic coordinator of clinical education at the University of Alabama in Birmingham for six years. And then I was very interested in teaching um, clinical education skills and mentoring skills through the section for education, now the Academy of Physical Therapy Education. Mm -hmm. And so um, I developed a course to help students uh, be better prepared to have a therapeutic presence in the clinic and have help clinical instructors be better prepared to be able to teach students rather than just tell them, do what I do and, and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And it, that's called the apprenticeship model. We, we needed to be clinical educators to be teachers. So. I said, all right, I would. And I wrote that book um, in 1986, um, 80, um, 87, 
um, over, over a period of time. Um, and uh, I actually, I, I, left, um, I left Boston and went back to Miami specifically to write the book in 1987. And I wrote it over a period of, of several weeks. I pulled all my materials together. I was just learning how to use Word on the computer. And I, I knew I could write longhand, but I didn't know if I could write, I, I could create typing. So it was a test for me too, to be able to create type in a, in, through a typewriter and still, and learn how to use a word um, uh, processing program on, on an IBM computer. So um, I, uh, I put it together, I gave it to Slack with, as an anthology. I said, here are the readings. This is what Slack, Slack said that they would publish the book. They actually commissioned it as well. Sent it to them, they said, oh, well, we can't do this because it's too expensive to get all of these, um, all of these uh, reprints of, uh, and to, to publish all this original material from Carl Jung and Carl, and Carl Rogers and, and, and all of the many people, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, all the people that I quote in the book, because it's an evidence-based book. I wrote it based on what people much, much brighter than I was, were writing about in the literature. And that's what I went to to prepare for my classes for uh, my students. So they gave it back to me and they said, you have to write it yourself. So I, um, I didn't quite know exactly how to do that. So I, I sat down on a, on a Monday and I, I read everything that I had on Monday and Tuesday and the first part of Wednesday. And then I did a, a, a process called throwing the runes. Now, if you're Celtic, you might know what I'm talking about, but the runes are little stones and they have symbols on them. Yes. And here. <laughs> you, it, it's like tarot cards or whatever. It, 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 it takes your question and introduces you to an answer and opens a, perhaps a door that you hadn't seen. And so I wrote, read all the material, for example, on, um, on uh, values. And I said, okay, now how, how do I write this chapter? And, and then I'd throw the runes and, and I'd read the runes reading. And that would zero me right in on what was really most important about all that material. And then I'd start typing. Then I'd type Wednesday afternoon, all day Thursday, all day Friday, Saturday. I'd type it up. I'd give myself Sunday off. Monday, I'd start again. There were 10 chapters. I did that for 10 weeks. I sent it in. I was really happy with it because it was really, it came from my heart, it came from my values. It came from my, uh, my belief that physical therapists, all health professionals really, really needed to develop themselves in with therapeutic presence so that we are, who we are is, is just as important as what we know in healthcare. And we're now getting the science together where we can show neurophysiologically how that works, how, how we are mm -hmm. makes a difference on the healing uh, response from the patient. Wonderful new study that, that recently came out. So anyway, um, it, it came out in 1988 and um, Slack published it and it took off and it became their bestseller for like 15 years in a row, my book, of all the books that they published, my book was the number one bestseller. They, 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 have, my, they have the picture of, yep, that one, and then the second edition, and then the third edition, and the fourth edition. This is the fifth edition, and the sixth edition, the fifth edition, and then the sixth edition came out um, in 19, uh, or 2018, I think. And now, of course, they're going to, going to do a seventh edition. So it's really a kind of a, an epic text. And uh, many, many schools use it. I have wonderful stories of people coming up to me like you and saying this book meant so much to me. But I, I love opening it up and reading it and remembering. And, um, and I go back to it as a text very often. To, to uh, One of my favorite Hel Helen Hislop stories is, if, and again, physical therapists will know who Helen Hislop is. Mm -hmm. And Helen Hislop uh, is the one who developed our, our idea of our, our body of knowledge is um, biokinesiology. Mm -hmm. And um, Helen Hislop used to just dismiss all this attitude and touchy-feely stuff. And, and she wanted to talk to me about other important things and curriculum design and all other kinds of things. And she 
And so I, I just listened to her and I'd smile. And she said, you know, that's not, that's not evidence-based. And so she became um, disabled herself in the final few years of her life. Um, and we were uh, in touch by phone. And for the um, sixth, no, the fifth edition, I guess. Yeah, the fifth edition. I said, would you be willing to read my uh, draft of my fifth edition and see if you would be willing to write a foreword for this book, this book that, you, that you're, you're not very fond of? And she said, oh, go ahead and send it to me. Well, <laughs> she wrote the most beautiful foreword because of course she was a patient. Mm -hmm. And she also recognized that research and evidence is much broader than randomized trials. And it has to do with uh, literature and, and the arts and uh, how they can inform us as human beings to be better present for our patients. So that was the, Geneva Johnson asking me to do it. And then Helen Hislop writing the forward to the fifth edition, two strong, powerful women in physical therapy, mm -hmm. in essence, saying, good, good work, good work, Carol. This is good. Made me feel very proud. Well, fantastic. I, I just think it's so important because it's that that connection that we have to make with our patients and those yeah. of us who learn how to make that connection, I, I, it just gives us such a better opportunity to help them. Right, exactly. And, and I just, um, I, don't, I don't think, I think everybody wants to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But th there are some skills that we, c th there are biases, implicit biases that we aren't aware of. There are personality quirks that can really get in the way. And that's, this book is meant to train students to make them aware of the things that are going to interfere with their therapeutic presence and then train them to be able to begin to, to communicate in a way that's much more um, lucid. Most of all, it helps them with their fears, fears of dying. Uh, fears of being assertive, fears of um, of not knowing what to say if somebody comes on to you inappropriately sexually, fears of uh, what do I say if somebody wants to talk about religion. Um, those are all covered in the book and skills on how to handle that in a therapeutic way so that the patient benefits. Well, I know when I was looking through this over the weekend, and, and even a few months ago, I came across it. And, and every now and then, when I when I do get to that bookshelf that has it there, I pull it out, and it was it was fun to look at the things that I had written in there. And you know, to say, it, one page even said, you know, I was 28 years old when I was writing in this book. And then, you know, to compare the answers to like how I would feel now. And so, um, I I going through it. I'm going to be sharing it with our staff here. I, I have. Um, massage therapists who work with me and do myofascial work. And so uh -huh, I'm, gonna, uh -huh. I'm excited to share it with them because I, I think it's probably a part of what has made me the therapist that I, that I am today. I mean, there's, there's no doubt. And so it's, it, you know, I was thinking when, when you wrote this, so you mentioned when you wrote it, did you know John Barnes at that time? And then how did, how did you meet him? And then just, it's amazing to me how this book is so valuable with specifically myofascial release work. You know, it's interesting how that all through, you know, came together. You know, you're the first person that's made that connection other, other than myself, but I was really primed to look for the what, what's more because I was doing PNF and I was doing um, um, applied neurophysiology with my patients mm -hmm. and a lot of, um, of hands-on work. But when I would teach PNF and the nervous system, um, the, the, the people that taking the course, they were physical therapists, would say, well, would you talk more about the therapeutic use of your body and your voice? And they were talking about connection. They were talking about how do we influence the nervous system, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with our patient through our body, our body language, our, the tone of our voice, the firmness of our grip and so forth. And you know, I have a twin sister, so I have this ESP connection and that's okay. always kind of drives me to look and different places besides random, randomized trials and standard science. Right. I was looking for the what else, what's more, and I didn't know where to find it. And a colleague of mine said, you know, I, have you heard about this Barnes guy? And I said, well, I'm reading about him in um, every inch and a half or whatever that little publication was and, and all, of the, all, of the, all of the controversy. And he was being dismissed pretty widely in physical therapy circles. 
as being unscientific. And I said, he said, why don't you, he's going to be here um, in Fort Lauderdale. Take that course, see what you think. <clears throat> I don't, <clears throat> I don't think he's, excuse me. I don't think he's a very good teacher. <clears throat> excuse me. So I signed up for the course, not knowing exactly what I was going to, I mean, just, just to, to check it out. But in the back of my mind, I thought he might really be onto something because I was already studying inter interaction and energetics. And um, when I took myofascial one in 1989, um, I realized, <clears throat> as John often says, this is the missing link. Um, I, when I felt that what we thought then was the cranial rhythm. It, it was it was a rhythm in the cranium, but it's really the akashic field affecting our whole body, our cells, and our the whole energy um, of the fascial web. Mm -hmm. When I felt that, I felt as though I had a, a kind of a, a, a a religious experience. I mean, it's the only thing I can say about it. I I, I tend to stay away from those metaphysical terms, but. The fact is, it's a very transcendent, I said, that's the word I want, transcendent experience. I knew that this was the rhythm that was behind all the other rhythms, the heart rate, the breathing, the circadian rhythm, that this rhythm, this was the foundational rhythm. And actually, I sat down and talked with him at lunch about patient practitioner action. I, mm -hmm. I actually talked to him about that, but he asked me, do you, have you written anything? And I said, well, I have a book. And he said, what's it about? And I said, therapeutic presence. And and he said, well, I'd, I'd be interested in looking at it. And um, I think I sent him a copy, I'm not sure. And we kind of stayed in touch from 1989. to, And I knew at, at that point, Cindy, that I was gonna have to change my practice. And I was gonna have to, I couldn't go back, you know. And now, now that I went through that doorway, mm -hmm. that was the way I was gonna have to practice. And I knew I needed to know a whole lot more about fascia. I needed to know a whole lot more about energy and subtle energy. And so I started reading and I started thinking and, and I was caught up at the time in, um, in, in my work at the University of Miami, um, working with the faculty, pulling new faculty in, writing new philosophy and new objectives for the, for the program, for the master's program, designing curriculum materials. And so I wasn't treating patients at the time. And <clears throat> I, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I, I decided that what I needed to do was to read some more. And so I asked for, actually in 1993, I asked for a leave of absence over the summer <clears throat> so I could read and write. <clears throat> and I knew who I wanted to read. I knew I wanted to read more about David Bohm and I wanted to read who was a physicist who spoke my language mm -hmm. about the explicate order and the implicate order. I knew I wanted to learn more about Krishnamurti I knew I wanted to learn more about these people, but I didn't have the time to read. So I got out of the city and I thought, well, where do I want to go? I thought, well, I'd heard some things about Sedona and about it being an energy place mm -hmm. and a place where you could get really tag into your creativity. So I had friends who lived in Sedona and I said, do you know anybody who needs to house sit and need a house sit? And, and they did. And so I actually, went to Sedona, was house sitting and writing every day Wow! in June of 1993. I came upon this material and I wanted to talk to John Barnes about it. So I called his um, office in Paoli and I, I said, I'd like to talk to John. He's, they said, well, he's, he's not here. And I said, well, when will he be back? And they said, well, uh, he's out, he's at, in Sedona. <laughs> I said, Oh, okay. Well, I'm in Sedona. <laughs> any, any chance I might be able to meet up with him? And this was before cell phones, of course. So, yeah. Um, I he they said um, call back and and he left a message. He said, "No, he called me and he said, you know where that old artist shack is out on 89A?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said that run down place. I said, "Yeah, it's right on the side of the of the cliff going down to Oak Creek." He said, "Yeah." He said, I'll see you there on um, the 4th of July, or maybe it was the 3rd of July, um, about one o'clock. I said, all right. So <laughs> I, I showed up at one o'clock and, and there was a car there, but I couldn't find anybody. And this, the place was really a shack. Mm -hmm. And um, the waterfall goes right through the building, you know, and uh, 
and so I, I started looking around and I looked down and into the into the ravine and there he was sitting on that rock that's right right in front of the the western treatment center mm -hmm. so I made my way out there were three beautiful women in bikinis there too <laughs> so I made my way out <laughs> I sat with him on that rock and we had a great conversation. He said, what do you, I said, you see that, that shack there? I'm gonna make that my Western treatment center. And then he said, what are you gonna to do to move healthcare forward in the 20th century, in the 21st century? I said, well, I, I, I think I'd like to write. I'd like to write a book, but I'm, I, I'm not sure I can. He said, well, why can't you? You've already written a book. You know how to do that. I said, I know, but I know I'll be ostracized from the profession. Because of the um, because of the nature of the science, he mm -hmm. said, if you if you live your life worried about what other people think of you, you're going to be a very unhappy person. He said, I'm going to open this treatment center in two years, and you're going to write a book. And he did, and I did, wow. and that was the first edition of Complementary Therapies and Rehabilitation. And I knew at that time that fascia and the interaction was the 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 organizing element of all of it of all complementary therapies but i didn't quite know how or why but i knew that there were physical therapists teaching other therapies and they didn't have they'd say oh that's not scientific so i wrote it as a scientific text so that people could say yes there is science to show that this this particular technique whether it's myofascial release or craniosacral or Reiki or Pilates or um, uh, acupuncture. They were all Tai Chi, Qigong. Um, they were all in there. Jin Shin Do was in the first uh, edition. And I, um, I, I had the authors write, I wrote the science chapter as much as we knew about it. At the time it was mind body medicine. We knew that the mind and the body couldn't be separated. And some of the data that showed that, that the mind did affect the body and the body affected the mind. That was through the cancer studies and how support groups really helped women with breast cancer recover and not, not uh, uh, have a reoccurrence. And then um, I had all the authors write about what they were using and, and, and write the science, mm -hmm. <clears throat> document the science that they used to show that this had efficacy because we really were moving strong toward evidence-based at that time. Yeah. And so um, I did it and, and, and then uh, it didn't sell very many copies, but then I started to design a course and we, we, we transitioned into the DPT at, at Miami and we started opening up this course, first as an elective and then as, um, um, the, well, and using the text as a as a, a manual for the elective, and then uh, then I I developed a course, and they they went through the course with the text for six weeks, a half a semester, twice a week, three hours, and um, it was mandatory. And so I got I got some criticism. Um, it um, it started to take off a little bit more toward the end of the '90s and the beginning of the 2000s. Um, in terms of selling. I was criticized pretty uh, vociferously by the editor of the journal at the time. And we had some exchanges and letters to the editor and in, about what constitutes um, valuable evidence. I was, uh, uh, John has been attacked too. You know, it's, it's people are afraid. It goes against the grain, but it's, uh, it's really difficult to argue about it now. It's really starting to take hold and more and more curricula have complementary therapies as part of their programs. So that's how I met John. And that's, and then I began taking the courses. I began treating patients in 1995. Mm -hmm. And I never, I always used Barnes myofascial release and exercise for the rest of my career. And I never stopped treating patients. Mm -hmm. So I always treat patients every week. But when I was at, at the university, we had a faculty clinic. And then I worked at Polestar Pilates from 2003 to 13. And then I went to integrative therapies and wellness in North Miami in 2015. And, and I'm still there mm -hmm. when I can travel again. Yeah, great places. I've, I've actually referred those places to people who ask if I know anyone down there. So 
Good. Um, I've never been there myself. <laughs> uh-huh. but, um, it's Great. it's amazing to me that you were doing this back in the the mid '90s, really. So you you were really ahead of the curve, kind of like John in in that way at, about these these alternative therapies. And you know, even when I'm actually really lucky that let's see, I graduated PT school in in '96. So I had just a one hour lecture. Do you remember that video John had? I think he still sells it actually where it's like an hour. He talks about myofascial release and uses that, that old biotensegrity like model. He has that in, mm-hmm. in, in there as well. So he, she played that for our class and just right away, I knew there was something about it. Like I just- Yeah, you got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was like, whoa, this is really- Right, yeah. You know, my ears went up, you know? <clears throat> <laughs> and then mm-hmm. we had a, a, and the person who played it wasn't a myofascial, had not been to any courses, but had come across this video as one of our instructors and wanted to make sure we knew about it, which, you know, thank goodness that she did that. Well, then we had a lab and she did, you know, cross hand, we did cross hand techniques and we did arm and leg pulls and, and that was about it. But I, I mean, I can still like be back in the room at that point. Like I can remember that so clearly and thinking, wow, this is really amazing stuff. And here's something that, that happened that, you know, as you're talking about this, it, it triggered in, in my mind, there was a, a, another instructor in that program who was coming into the room as we were all kind of coming out of, out of this lab. And, you know, I was all geeked up because I had this experience, like, this is really something I didn't quite know all it would end up being. But I heard him say to someone, you know, just kind of in a conversation that I was overhearing is, yeah, I don't believe in that stuff. And I thought, I mean, here you are, like, what do you know about it? You didn't hear, you know, I was, I immediately became defensive, which made me even want to know more about it. Kind of like, well, really, you don't, you're not interested in that. So, but as you see, all through these years, there's been this struggle to, to be looked upon in the way that we should be. And now it's, it's coming around full circle. And I, it, I want to know, like, what do you feel? What are some of your successes, I guess, in getting this information out to clinicians like that person I just mentioned? You know, I, I feel like that tide is turning a bit. And one of the reasons why I, you know, stepped out and had my own place is that I was feeling all of this energy and, and these things that you couldn't talk about with these, you know, outcome-based studies, evidence-based this or that. And, you know, the, it's very hard to, to research this stuff. And so, I guess what I want to do more now in this day and age, and here we are in physical therapy month, how can we move forward in physical therapy to bring to light this energetic piece, this Akashic field? I mean, for someone to even say that back in 96 would have been like, whoa, right? So talk about maybe some of your successes and how can we as PTs and practitioners of myofascial release explain and help people to know that this is really something important. I mean, like once you, once you see it, you can't go back. And the, you know, sometimes people don't know what they're missing, I think in the medical field. And so, you know, how do you, what has been successful in, in that for you? Well, there's nothing more successful than helping people feel better and get rid of their pain. And so probably the most dramatic ways that I've had success is treating physicians and my colleagues, physical therapists, Mm -hmm. who um, were tending not to believe. But I would take the time to explain to them. I'd show them strolling under the skin. I'd talk to them about fascia. And I'd talk to them about subtle energy, not just fascia as a structural representation, of what's happening under our skin. It's not, we are fascia. And, and the, there are lots of functions of fascia. It gives us form. It, it is the, the, it holds all of our organs. All of our organs are embedded in it. It holds the nervous system. The nervous system is embedded in it. And um, it is a communication system for all the cells. And uh, probably one of the most meaningful moments, two, two meaningful moments of treating physicians, both of them top researchers at the University of Miami, one um, at the, um, in kidney research and one in breast cancer research. And um, Dan Mintz wouldn't mind me using his name. He, was, he, was, uh, he brought uh, Camilla Riccardi to the University of Miami to do 
the um, insulin research, the diabetes research wow. at the Bi Diabetes Institute. And he had a he had had a scoliosis from an empyema. He had after a hurricane, he was trimming a tree and he fell and he punctured his, uh, his chest and his lung and he had a massive infection and and he healed but he healed crooked and so i was working with him um uh, sidelining of course a lot but working where all the restrictions were talking to him about fascia and i was talking about fascia there there is no such thing as a muscle there's only a myofascial all of the cells in our body all the parenchyma of the cells of the glands and the organs in our body are embedded within the fascia and need the fascia in order to function. The stomach, the heart, the brains, the lungs, everything, the kidneys. Mm -hmm. And it, it, if you can't, if you strip away the fascia, they can't, they can't function. And he said, oh my heavens. And I said, what? He said, that explains it. In the early 1980s, he was trying to grow new stem cells from, um, from the liver to, to implant into the liver, stem cells from the blood to implant into the river, li river, liver to produce insulin for people who had lost their ability for the pancreas to, to produce insulin. The liver also produces insulin. And uh, he was trying to use, to grow these stem cells and then implant them. So he would take this, the, the cells out of wherever he was, he was uh, getting them from. I think it was from the pancreas. And he'd strip all of the fascia away and put it into the petri dish and they wouldn't grow mm. and they wouldn't grow. And he got so frustrated. He said, one day I just took a mass of cells and threw it in the petri dish and put the top on the petri dish and they grew. Wow. <laughs> said, I said, right. <laughs> they needed the fascia and they needed the fascia as a communication to the external environment. That's exactly how it works. So that was a breakthrough moment. And then he got better and he felt better and he felt his scoli I mean, on, on picture, his scoliosis improved. He had, um, he had breath. He said, when I do my rounds now, my patients say, what, how have you changed? What's different? Um, you're more alive, they would say. Mm -hmm. And he felt more alive. And it was myofascial release. It was the sustained pressure and then elongation and waiting. And I say, bring your attention now, breathe into my hands. Bring your attention to what's happening. And, and he, would, he would connect with it and he would feel it. Um, the other was uh, a breast cancer researcher who was very powerful, um, probably the biggest NIH money uh, researcher in breast cancer. Yeah. And she had a, um, a, uh, a cyst, spinal cord cyst. And so they, um, they operated and took care of the cyst. And then of course she had scar tissue. So then the symptoms started coming back again. And I, I met her, I had heard about her for years. She came in, I met her and I started talking to her about fascia. I showed her strolling under the skin, but I did show her the energy piece too. She kind of glazed over. And then I was, I was working with her over time. She really started to feel the difference. And at one moment I was doing a leg pull and I was inspired. And you know, when you're working in this way you're inspired to ask questions, to to pay attention in a certain way. <clears throat> There's a wisdom that happens between what I call the transcendent energy, the Akashic field, the, the person's energy and the knowing and the patient's energy and your knowing, they all kind of mix together. And there's an information available to you, to the practitioner, if you pay attention in a certain way. And so <clears throat> I was centering and paying attention in this leg pull. And I was inspired to say, um, I'll use another name because I don't I don't know whether she would give me permission to give her each time. I said, um, Karen, do you believe that cells talk to one another? Now, for a traditional scientist to ask that question, they would laugh in your face. <laughs> and she said, Of course. Of course, cells talk to one another. And then I told her about the research that Mina Bissell has been doing of um, of where she took tumor cells from rats, <clears throat> excuse me, from rats that had breast cancer and took those tumor cells and put them in a, um, a dish, a Petri dish, and they grew um, and they grew more and more. 
and then um, she 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 took the um, and they were and she cleaned the fascia off. Then she took tumor cells from the brat and put it in a petri dish with normal fascia. They, she took got away from all of the abnormal fascia that she could, and she seeded it in normal fascia, and the tumor reverted to normal. So then they began to say, what is it about the, the tumor and the environment <clears throat> that makes a difference? So they took the cytokines out of communication that allowed for communication. They somehow, <clears throat> excuse me, were able to strip the, the, the cancer cells of their um, uh, cytokines that would, would have them be communicating with their environment. And they put it in the normal fascia and the cancer grew. So then they realized that it wasn't the structural aspect of the normal fascia compressing on the tumor cell. It was the communication. The cell, the, the, the tumor cell, the breast tumor cell didn't know where it was in relation to its neighbors, in relation, and, and needed to grow bigger in order to try to understand where it was in relation to the rest. <clears throat> so she was very impressed with that. Now, I haven't seen many follow-up studies. I think they're probably trying to repeat that, but I did read two follow-up studies where MIT was trying to figure out how to inject something into fascia to soften it so yeah. that you could get rid of breast, you know, they want to do a chemistry, they want to do a, a pharmacology mm -hmm. uh, answer where, you know, it's, it's pressure and um, electromagnetic uh, and energy and the heat coming out of our hands that's changing the nature of the ground substance and making it thinner. Mm -hmm. It's going from very, very thick to thinner and then giving the place more room underneath our hands, the, 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 the extracellular matrix more room so that we can help people who have impingements on their sp spine or impingements on nervous tissue, give them more room so that we're not changing the bones as much and we're not really changing the very, very thick lumbo thoracic lumbar fascia either, that, that, that very thick leather type fascia, but we are changing the environment around it and allowing it to open up more and get blood in there and, and lymph to remove the, the toxins from the inflammatory process. So that's all established now in the literature. It's, it's Gerald Pollack's work in water and crystalline water. It's Jean-Claude Gimbarteau in Strolling Under the Skin and his work. The book is right over your left ear behind yes. you, um, <laughs> The Architecture of the Fascia. Um, and John Barnes had been talking about this in, 19, in the late 1970s. He saw this picture of fascia. He understood the communication. And that's what uh, he just kept teaching for those principles. And those are the principles that, have, that really stand us in good stead. In comparison to other places that, that rip and tear fascia, we melt the ground substance, literally, change the structure of the ground substance so that the cells can grow and, and flourish. Yeah, wow, that is fascinating. And I, it just goes right into that. Um, I had written myself a couple of notes here, <laughs> but this is just so much better. But the fascia informed therapist, we talked about it briefly. Yeah. Um, I had the, the pleasure of being able to watch the British Fascia Symposium and, and your presentation there. And I um, then I saw John a couple weeks back. Um, I went to Malvern and I, I took advanced unwinding again and, and did SES. And I, I told him that I got to see you there and that it, it, it was great. And that, you know, now people are talking about this other piece and that for so many years when he was ignored, it, it, you know, but, but now, and it wasn't just you, I, I believe, um, her, her name escapes me right now. Jan um, had talked about the. Shirwatha. Jan yeah, Shirwatha. Yeah. The, her, the hold your sternum. Holding, oh my goodness. That was so great. And then, and then following up with, with your talk, I, I wonder if there's anything you wanted to, to share about that and how, you know, it's, it's exciting for those of us who've been doing this for many years to, to see that, Hey, people are finally listening and, and how can we as PTs and, and other myofascial therapists, whether massage therapists or occupational therapists become more 
fascia informed so that we are truly fascia informed therapists and that now that this is is really coming out there it's not just in our our, our little groups yeah well you need to read mm -hmm. and you know physical therapists get this idea that well now i'm out of school i don't i don't have to read all that heavy science you don't really need to read all the heavy science but you do need to keep up with what's happening in terms of um, reading about uh, t what's happening in the tissue and about biotensegrity, understanding what biotensegrity is, mm -hmm. and then and understanding the fullness of fascia and, and just recognizing the soft tissue um, breakthroughs that are coming. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate the biotensegrity tea party on Fridays between 12 Eastern, 12 and um, about 2.30 where people from all over the world come in and there's a discussion about something about biotensegrity. Mm -hmm. Now, biotensegrity is the architecture uh, that the fascia follows inside the body, is, makes it biotensegrity. Tensegrity itself is an architecture that's based on uh, triangles and polygons where there's a, a, an elastic component or a, or a pull component and a push con component. So there's constant push-pull. And um, that push-pull tensegrity unit starts with the cell, with the electrons in the electron in the orbits around the nucleus. They're pulled in toward the nucleus and they pull out into the electron field. That force field was occurring before you were conceived, but of course it comes in through the sperm and the egg, and then the zygote develops embryologically in this push-pull environment as it unfolds and self-determines itself through um, and self-motivates and self-organizes itself around the blueprint. And then we become this person. Um, we never stop developing. Mm -hmm. It's a very dynamic, there's no such thing as um, as um, well, I've, I've lost the word, um, homeostasis. There's yeah. no such thing yeah. as homeostasis. It's only homeodynamics. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's everything's always changing. Uh, we get a new skeletal system every two years. We get a new skin every two weeks. We get a new stomach lining every week. We get new, you know, only the, or, the only organ that doesn't rejuvenate itself, including the brain, is the lens of the eye. And that's why we get cataracts. You know, there's oxidation, in the lens of the eye. And so we have to have sometimes the lens replaced. But every other part of our bodies renews itself. It's constantly renewing, constantly growing. And in this web of tissue, these polygons that are formed in this polygonous dynamic structure, the structure itself um, gives us our form, gives us our, 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 what you see when you see us, but it also, and, and Steve Levin is the founder of Biotensegrity, an orthopedic surgeon who knew John and they communicated back and forth um, in, back in the, in the early 80s about this. Um, but, but Steve Levin said, you know, that it's, a, it's a fallacy to think that the that the ligaments hold the joint together. That's not, the joints aren't held together. They're, they're apart. What's holding it apart? Well, actually, Jaap Rondervall says it's not a ligament, it's a dynamit. It's the, 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 the dynamit is giving a stretch, uh, not a stretch, a, a, an elongation at the joint. At the same time, the bones are compressing. So you get the compression and the tension in something as structure as, as simple as a joint. And then we talk about where are the levers? There are no levers. There are no fulcrums. This is all soft tissue at work, dynamic at work, constantly. And that is exciting. And then you realize that there are a couple of people that are teaching anatomy this way. Gil Headley teaches this way. Um, John Sharkey teaches this way. And John Sharkey comes on regularly into the Biotensegrity Tea Party and he comments and he does courses online. And so there are lots of dynamic ways that we can learn about this living tissue as, it, as we get to know more and more and more. Go to YouTube and listen to Bruce Lipton yes. talk about um, cellular communication and, and Donald Ingber and the cano transduction and the infrared energy from our hands going down into the integrins, into the 
into the tubules of the cytoplasm, into the tubules of the nucleus, into the DNA of our cells. Every time we touch anybody anywhere, our energy is communicating with the cell down to the DNA of the nucleus. And this is all biologically, histologically proven. It's not conjecture. It's not um, woo-woo. Yeah. So <clears throat> in, in physical therapy schools, the way I would do it is I would start out with with a, a course in um, probably with in anthropology, but I certainly <laughs> would start out with histology and about cells and looking at what at fascia as the framework within which everything that we do in physical therapy is is housed. Fascia is the embody it, it is the embodiment of everything that we do in physical therapy, where we're nervous system, um, skin, cardiopulmonary, musculoskeletal, whatever we are, we have to understand how fascia works in all of that. And it either works to our detriment or works to the, 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 the harm of the patient, the restriction of the patient. We have to get through that restriction to help them to move again. Okay, it might be lungs. We might have to teach them about breathing. But what happens in the lungs with the fascia? What, what's going on with the diaphragm? What's going on with the parenchyma around the pleura and, and, and how the pleura works and how the lungs glide inside the pleura and how hyaluronin has everything to do with that. That's part of fascia. And essentially it's all soft tissue. We learned in biokinesiology, we learned a kinesiology of levers and fulcrums and, and solid state physics. There's nothing solid inside our bodies. Even bones are fascia that have hydroxyapatite crystals at, in about a third of it. Most of it's water. You take the hydroxyapatite crystals out and you can tie a bone into a knot. We see these dead bones and think that's the way, think that's the way it is. That's not it at all. Mm -hmm. It's all dynamic and it's all fluid. And we are communicating with our minds, with our hearts, with our touch, with our, our, our voices. We're communicating directly, not just through touch and proprioception, but through interoception. The patient's taking in what we're saying and it's going into the insular cortex. And, it, and there's, a, there's a, 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 do I feel safe here? Do I, do I understand this enough that I trust that this person's going to help me? Makes all the difference in the world to the therapeutic outcome. Physical therapy is not there yet. So I'd start in massage and start in, I start in gross anatomy. I'd say, okay, here's what, <clears throat> this is the way I did it at Miami. <clears throat> Show them strolling under the skin. This is not what you're gonna see on your cadaver. This is a true, true to life. Then I go into the massage class and I talk to them about standard massage and they do, they do manipulation of the tissue. Then they do compression and elongation. And notice I don't say shear anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't shear because shears slice and cut through and, and, mm -hmm. and tear. We're going down to where the person pushes back, meeting their resistance, not deep. If we wanna go deep to get the deep fascia, no. It's all one web and it comes, comes all the way out to the epidermis, the fascia does. So we're pressing down till we feel the resistance of the person, taking a deep breath and then separating our hands. And, and then we'll come to a dead halt, John teaches. And that's the collagen barrier. And John says, now you stay there from three to five minutes. You say, what am I gonna do for three to five? Well, listen, listen, listen to what's happening. Listen with your whole body, listen with your proprioceptors, Listen with your energy, feel what's going on inside your, be centered, feel what's going on. And all of a sudden you'll start this communication, this, this dynamic communications going on and five minutes will go away and you'll look at the clock and think, oh, well, or you'll be, you'll be moved to go someplace else because, oh, I feel that down on my right side. Okay, let's go down there. That's the fascial voice saying it's stuck down there. I was doing up here. I was releasing up here. And the communication was down here. Okay, let's release down there. At the end of 45, 55 minutes, they get up and think, oh, I feel so light. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm straight. I feel my, my head's over my shoulders. My shoulders are over my pelvis. I feel my feet on the floor. And they talk about this lightness. Where does that come from? Is that just all in their heads? Well, a lot of it is a perception of the space that we've given them when the extracellular matrix, which was congealed and hardened together and pressing on pain sensitive structures, 
opens up and you actually can, you get a, 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 a dilation of the blood vessels and you can see that the blood is rushing in and, and the people will feel, you, you bring their, their attention. Can you feel my hands moving? I'm not moving my hands. You're moving my hands. Your energy, your fascia, as it releases, is moving my hands. Get them to pay attention to what's going on. Get them out of their left brains, into their bodies. And then that attention to what you're doing and intention to help and to listen and to be connected in resonance, energetic, literally, not figuratively, literally in resonance with their energy and the energy of the energy beyond us, the wisdom of the, that goes beyond us, all all in resonance. After 45 to 55 minutes, the therapist feels better, the patient feels better, and there's a, there's a recognition that something very, very powerful just happened. And it goes way beyond traditional physical therapy. Does that mean traditional physical therapy is worthless? Absolutely not, absolutely not. I use the exercises, I use the, the, the examination evaluation skills, I use, I, I am a physical therapist. I'm using this as my therapeutic process, along with exercise, to help people because I find that it works faster and better and lasts longer than any straight plane PREs that I could give anybody. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was beautiful. <laughs> All of that explanation. It, it's it's, you know, it's so common to to us and especially for you for all these years. It's it's shocking to think that not every physical therapist is taught this, you know, um, at the at the ground level and, and even in medical school and, and anatomy yeah. courses. I mean, you know, any thoughts in, in, in your mind as to how long it will take for this to become just, you know, common knowledge at the medical school level? Well, John and I used to have a, a joke. We would guess uh, in the late 90s, he said, how, how, what do you think the tipping point is going to be when the courses will start to get sold out? The people will just be flocking. And I said, I think about 2005. And he said, and this was like 1997. He said, I think about 2000. I said, I think about 2007. Well, about 2006, he had to start teaching many of us how to teach for him and he did the right. dvd courses right. and so uh, uh seven or eight of us he trained us to teach for him while he was up on the screen mm -hmm. and then we ran the labs and because the courses were just being he couldn't he couldn't do it all mm -hmm. and that's the way it is now they're sold out they're just but how do you get that into medical school we work with physicians we talk to physicians we we say, send me your patients. We, um, before you have surgery, let me try. I used to be the last ditch effort for people with back pain, even carpal tunnel. No, nobody has ever come to me with carpal tunnel, never had to have surgery. Yeah. And, and we let, was a hand surgeon and she and I were very close and she would send her patients to me. And, and she, she loved doing surgery, but you know, she didn't want to have to do surgery. She didn't have to. And those are the good surgeons. But um, little by little, um, we've just got to keep the literature coming out. The last Biotin Sacred Tea Party, not the last one, the one before, number 27, I think, was between Jean-Claude Gimbarteau, who's a physician surgeon, and Neil Galloway, who's a surgeon. Neil Galloway is, at, is Scottish, but he's at Emory University, and Jean-Claude is in France. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they were talking, uh, talking as surgeons what do we need to do to get this into medical schools? How can we, and Neil was very adamant about the fact that you his, his colleagues that were so stuck had to die. He said, I, I'm sorry that I have to be so fatalistic about this. This is the only way that it's gonna start making a difference. But I once had a wonderful conversation with Jean-Claude, I think it was 2015, 16, 2016 in, in Dundee at John Sharkey's anatomy course, mm -hmm. the fascial anatomy, and, and Jean-Claude was there as a guest lecturer. And he and Jan van der Waal and I were having breakfast together. I think you've heard me tell this story. And, and Jean-Claude said, um, a, a videographer came up to me and, and said he wanted to do a video. He said, what, what is this fascia? 
stuff. And we, we both laughed and I said, well, he didn't do his homework, did he? And he said, no. And I said, well, Jean-Claude, what do you think? When do you think the whole world will really understand, when people will understand the importance of this tissue? And he said, when the whole world recognizes that fascia is the foundation of life, the foundation of life, all living matter, is fascia, even the one celled amoeba mm -hmm. is fascia based. And the communication that goes into an amoeba without a spinal cord, without, without any nervous system, is the energy, the transcendent energy, and that comes into the amoeba. And the amoeba knows how to respond, how to avoid danger, how to go toward food. I mean, this is the found th this is the structure and the process that keeps living things alive and thriving. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're interested, anybody interested in the real, in the, in the, in the science, in the histology and the, and the biophysics of all of this, it's James Oshman's book, um, uh, Energy Medicine of the New Science, James Oshman. Mm -hmm. He's the person I would send you to. Mm -hmm. And I already talked about Gerald Pollock's, The mm -hmm. Fourth Phase of Water. And how water, when we take water in as H2O, it's a, a molecule like this, two oxygens and a hydrogen. And as we swallow it, there's, they think that there's something about the circulation of it in the inside of the uh, esophagus down into the stomach. There are, there are grooves in it. And the, the water gets twirled around and it goes from H2O to H3O2 and flattens out and becomes heavy water. Heavy water has a, is crystalline in nature. So the, and the electrons are not at all as stable as an H2O. In H3O2, the electrons are, are very loose and you press on it and the electrons fly out from it. And that's part of what's happening that we've, we're feeling in our hands as the fascia is in, in, impacted by 65 to 70% of us is water. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not free water, it's bound water. It's all in the fascia. There is no free water in, in the body. The only time you get free water coming out when you slice into the body is when you slice a vessel or when you slice a lymphatic or you slice between the cells and the, the bound water of the fascia comes out because you sliced the fascia. Mm -hmm. It's all like a grape. You know, a grape is bound water. And you can put a, a you can put a smoothie on top of grape and the grape will the grape will just sit there. You have to pound it in order to smash it. Like That's it. the way the water is inside of us. And the fascia uses that water to keep fluid and to keep, to keep the cells working and to keep everything um, uh, fluid. And, and all, of the, all of the work that's coming out of the steccos in Italy about the, the fascia sites that are actual cells that produce hyaluronin, which is the gluey stuff in our joints. It's part of fascia. It's, a, it's the a most liquid part of fascia. And then the, the collagen is bound, collagen in spirals. It, a spiral like the DNA, it's spiraled around, but it's coated in water on all sides. Fascia has, or collagen has this water, this heavy water coating around it. So you see, we're finding out histologically all kinds of reasons why pressure and elongation and weighting and energetic transfer opens up the tissue because it's working directly on that crystalline liquid crystal matrix that is the fascia web. Wow. So read, read, yeah. and listen, go to YouTube. Yeah. Bruce Lipton, uh, Gerald Pollack is on YouTube. John Barnes is on YouTube. Um, and, I'm on and, YouTube. You're yeah. on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Leg, legs up the wall. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and Gil Headley. Yeah, why do, why do legs up the wall? Why is legs up the wall so powerful? You are opening up your whole fascial web, as Cindy says, from your feet all the way up to your dura on around the brain when you put your legs up the wall like that yeah it's, it's just such a great time to be in and, and you know you mentioned around 2007 that was the first um fascia research congress right too it, yes that was at harvard you're right yeah, it, it, yeah. yep and that's when jean claude introduced strolling under the skin right yes and thank you for mentioning also the friday talks which i have not been able to be on one of those yet i really need to I, well they're on youtube like, Oh, just, oh, great, just great. Look, embodied biotensegrity, they, they, have, they, they have them all. You just put uh, biotensegrity, biotensegrity, capital T-E-A, and then put a number. Yeah. If, you put, um, if you put 
25 there, I think you'll see James Oshman. I, 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 I had a discussion with James for two hours about energy. And wow. that's the other thing I wanted to tell you, Cindy, even they, they're music teachers, they're physicists, there are microbiologists, there are um, yoga teachers, there are Feldenkrais people, there are Alexander people, there are Barnes, there are Bowen, there are Traeger, there are Rolfers, they're all, we're all on there. Movement, yoga, all on there learning about this tissue. Mm -hmm. And we all come at it from different points of view and different needs to understand, mm -hmm. trying, always trying to help our patients, you know, which is, it's really a, the applied biotensegrity. When we're trying to help somebody, we're not studying it just to study it. It's applied biotensegrity or inspired biotensegrity. That's the art that comes out with all of the shapes and the forms. Mm -hmm. That's in, or po poetry, right? Is inspired. Anyway, that um, that those those tea party groups tend to shy away from the things that we can't measure. You know, the energy. And right. so I'm constantly put putting that function stuff in and putting the energy stuff in, and then finally. Uh, Susan Lowell said, well, what, let's get, let's get you talking about this. I said, don't get me talking about it. Get James Oshman talking about it. And James came on and, and we had a wonderful discussion. So that those are the ways, those are the more entertaining ways that you can find out more about fascia. Right. Well, I'm definitely committed to spreading the word. And, you know, <laughs> I think the, the more of us who it, it's great that we, we have all these resources now, like even this, to be able to do this is just yeah. so fantastic right. and right. it's been a crazy year but it has really opened up a lot of really great new opportunities ideas and yeah. you know ways of, of learning and just you know knowledge but but really embodying that that knowledge and then being able to easily share it is just so so fantastic I feel really blessed to be able to have had this conversation with you here Carol well, thank you for asking me it's been a real pleasure to talk about my my career and my and what I'm passionate about of course yeah, I just feel like we could talk for hours and hours. <laughs> so maybe too. maybe we could again if you're if, a kid spirit for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And um I I you know we'll take comments if people want to comment if they're interested in more topics. And if you're interested in coming back again, I would love to. I just um, I mean, it's a great way to get to get the word out. Um yeah. You know, I know there's lots of information out there, but different things pull. And even if, if one person grabs something out of it and it's it helps them to move into a different place, then then it's it's worth it's it. It's worth it. Right. Exactly. I agree. And I, I do hope that in the spirit of physical therapy month, that maybe there's maybe there's even an instructor out there somewhere who will, who will grab and say, you know, our, our program is missing this. And, you know, it can start here. And I, I really do love the connection of this to this and these are probably old i know this is the old version and this is the old version too right the, no that's that's the latest version this is the newest one okay so uh, there's another there's another one probably going to be started at the end of the year and and come out next year when i when i look through this and i i have not read this cover to cover i'll be honest i pull out things that i that i think are my my favorites but i thought you know every every physical therapist <laughs> should be aware of this truly i mean really in physicians because you can't ignore this anymore and and well it's scientific it's it's evidence-based it fits in curricula yeah. right and so it's it's really a disservice to not have it i think um, i do too for patients sakes especially absolutely because patients need to know what their physical therapist recommends mm -hmm. and there are things that work better for certain things and situations and other things that work better for others mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. it's, it's, I tend to feel that Barnes myofascial release is really where you should start with right. exercise. Barnes myofascial release and exercise really are the go to therapy for me for any soft tissue problems, any pain. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just how it's all, it's all connected, as we say, it's almost seems. Yeah. And, and for wellness and prevention as well, mm -hmm. not just illness. Right. Right. Yeah. Any, any last thoughts or comments you want to throw in there? Well, thank you, Cindy, so much for having me be here. You know, I teach a lot of different kinds of people, Barnes, uh, massage therapists, chiropractors, nurses. Um, um, and, but I love teaching the physical therapists because we're family. Mm -hmm. And as much as I belong to the tribe, the Barnes tribe, I belong. <laughs> I belong to even 25 years before that to the physical therapy family. I am a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. They're physical therapy goes sometimes in directions that I can't follow. And where my scholarly interest is now is in fascia. 
and in biotensegrity and in understanding how to utilize the principles that John Barnes teaches for a therapeutic of benefit. So that's where my scholarly interest is, mm -hmm. but I'm still engaged with physical therapy. I'm still a, me a member of the Physical Therapy Learning Institute and, and working for change. And um, I'm a Catherine Worthingham Fellow, which is one of the greatest honors that ever was bestowed upon me uh, to be a fellow in the American Physical Therapy Association. So this is my heritage, it's mm -hmm. my identity. And um, I really thank you very much for inviting me here today to help celebrate that during PT month. Well, you're welcome. And really it's it's a treat for me. Like I said, I can just still picture that the room that I was in where I yeah. was was reading this book and thinking, who is this woman? And to be able to <laughs> to meet you and and to do this is is really i I feel blessed. So Great. thank you. Um well hopefully we will talk again soon. Okay, good later Great. and I will put this together so we can share it with the world. All right. Is it is it gonna be on YouTube? I, I will put it on, on YouTube and then I uh -huh. we can look at it on the and, Facebook page, right? The Facebook and, and your Facebook page is um, well, it's it's under my my name, Cindy Hodgson. It's there, and then I also put it to Essential Therapies. Essential Therapies. That's what I was looking Therapies. for. Okay, good. Yeah. Great. So we'll Wonderful. Have it there. And then the the YouTube channel is also Essential Therapies, so I'll have it up there too. This All right. Week. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks again. All right. Thank you, Cindy. Stay day. well. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.